We firstly welcome uh, Deacon Basil among us. Deacon Basil is a uh, deacon within the Byzantine Catholic Church, the Ruthenian uh, Catholic Church. Uh, there are 23 other rites, R-I-T-E-S, of Catholicism around the world. 90-something um, percent of the world's Catholics are Latin or Roman Catholics. 100% of Roman Catholics think they're the only ones that exist. <laughs> and so it's beautiful to um, kind of share this moment, share this time with a friend. Um, Deacon Basil and I crossed paths in seminary before he went in another direction. Um, but we've done some work together. He's also a trained uh, psychologist, therapist. Um, and so we've done a lot of pastoral work together um, in various parish contexts. And so it's a joy to have him here with us. It might be slightly confusing because this was also the weekend where we're inviting Deacon Tim Kilbarger, who was assigned to this parish. He came to the previous two masses, um, and so you'll eventually get to meet him, um, not this one. So, um, beautiful. Go ahead and think to yourself, what happens when you assume You go body and soul straight to heaven. What were you thinking? <laughs> Which is our public service announcement that August 15th is the feast of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, or if you swing that way, the Dormition, but that's a different homily. But that's a holy day of obligation. And so as you prepare um, for the faithful expression of your faith, there are five days throughout the year Thank, God, thank goodness you're not Ireland, in which case you have 11, um, where there are uh, obligatory mass days. And since Christmas is one of them, it's really four. And if it falls on a Saturday or a Monday, then you don't have to go. So it's really, you know, it's not as bad as it sounds. But these are moments of the faithful expression of our faith. At this parish, we're offering um, the school mass at 830 then a noon one, which will be 45 minutes, so work-friendly mass, um, and then a 7 p.m. evening mass as well. If you work downtown, if you work um, in the Denver Tech Center, um, there are a number of options if you just do a little bit of Googling. Um, and so it's just a beautiful way um, to rise to the level of the opportunity of fulfilling an obligation. Um, and there are many graces for those who choose to go above and beyond and do that. Today we celebrate the Feast of the Transfiguration. It's this moment in which in the, within the three-year period of formation of Peter, James, and John, the other apostles, Jesus is building them up for the mission that he has prepared for them for all eternity and is slowly revealing to them all that will transpire. But this is a moment of unique importance. Going up to the mountain, remember, biblically speaking, going to a mountaintop is a place of an expected encounter with God. And so going up to the mountain, the apostles know they're at least going to pray. They know that they're going to make God some part of the central act. If only Colorado 14er climbers would do the same. Nevertheless, going up to the heights... There's an expected encounter with God. The apostles just don't know what's going to happen. Jesus is radiantly transfigured before them. His face shines white. His clothes, whiter, more radiant than any fuller, any bleacher could dye. Jesus is manifested of where he comes from. He comes from the kingdom of of God's divine light, heaven, light from light, true God from true God. The beauty of this is that thing that the apostles see is actually always present. It's just not always visible. Jesus reveals this aspect of his true humanity and true divinity within himself. This is this moment where he's showing the manifold power of his divinity and building them up for a time that they will need. 
If you've been following the daily Mass readings, by the way, it's also a very beautiful thing if you can go once a week to daily Mass. Again, there are a number of options. We have an 8.30 uh, a.m. and a 5.30 p.m. on Wednesdays. Um, when I first got to the parish, I looked at all the other daily Mass offerings. There's one starting at St. Vincent de Paul at 6.30 and then literally every half hour in the area, and we're, we would be the last at 8.30. But if you've been following the daily mass readings, we've been going through the book of Exodus in which Moses goes to encounter God, goes to speak with him in the meeting tent, and then whenever he comes out, his face is radiant white. And so when this happens to Jesus, it's within the memory of the apostles that, oh, this is what happened to Moses. That this encounter with God changes us. It allows us to radiate something that is a part of us, but not coming from us. So too, whenever we place ourselves within the presence of God, whether in adoration, whether in prayer, whether you have the courage to make the sign of the cross and pray during your business lunch meeting, you and I bring God into the parts of our life and don't just leave him on the mountaintops that we rarely go to. The beauty of this, my friends, is Jesus is showing the transformation that comes for each one of us. Now, this is also a moment in which Jesus is beginning to set his face towards Jerusalem. Why is he going to Jerusalem? It's not for the hummus. He's going to Jerusalem to die, to be killed, to be massacred on a cross. Something that is going to be incredibly hard for his followers. Remember, the apostles were expecting someone to come in and kick Roman butt. That the liberation of Israel would be a political one in which they would be free to worship as a nation. By free to worship, they mean without the constraints of an, of an oppressive government. What they didn't expect is that they would be liberated, given a way out of the oppression of sin and death. Something even more tyrannical than any government. And so Jesus is beginning to stoke their faith for what is to come, the redemption of Israel through the cross. But look at Good Friday. Friday. How many of them were faithful on Good Friday? You see, it's easy to follow Jesus and to love him and to be associated with him when he's handing out free food. Jesus feeds the 5,000. His popularity polls are going way up. He could run for president. And then there's these other moments where he offers harder teachings. The forgiveness, even the love of an enemy. Praying for those who persecute you. Even the teaching on the Eucharist, my flesh is true food, it's not a mere symbol. My blood is true drink. For us, that's hard. For an ancient Jew, that's straight up heresy. But Jesus slowly, faithfully, lovingly along the way, walks with his people and moves them to a point of understanding and liberation. It's a beautiful mode of teaching for pastors. What we have in the preface for today, the preface is the part of the Mass, the Lord be with you and with your spirit, lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord, let us give thanks to the Lord our God, it is right and just. And we have the preface, two paragraphs of theology. And as I've said before, I think this is like the fail safe in the Mass in case the priest preached too much about his summer vacation, his stamp collection, whatever it is, that at least Jesus gets mentioned somewhere and you have to hear some portion of theology. It says here that the scandal of the cross might be removed from the hearts of the disciples. A scandalon is something that trips you up, a stumbling block. And a scandal is something that you have to get over or overcome in order for your faith to keep going. There have been scandals politically, 
There have been scandals in relationships and marriages. There's been scandals within the church. But we typically think of scandal as something evil or bad that somebody else did and it makes me resent them. It's not exactly it. The scandal is even deeper. The scandal of the cross had to be overcome within the hearts of the apostles. This moment of disappointment of, that was not the savior I had hoped for. This was not the kingdom I was expecting. This moment of disappointment, but then saying, okay, Lord, I'll follow you. You have the words of everlasting life. Where else am I going to go? And to faithfully pick up and follow Jesus. That one has to come and over, overcome a scandal of disappointment amid expectations. My friends, you and I have to do this on a moderately regular basis. When priests and bishops don't act how priests and bishops are supposed to. We have to overcome this when the fallenness of humanity comes to the fore. And it always points out Jesus' patient love of each one of us. So this moment of the transfiguration is incredibly important. Because by it, he shows his divinity such that when he preaches about what is to come, Amen, amen, I say to you, the Son of Man truly must die, suffer and die, and on the third day be raised from the dead. They don't exactly know what that means. They don't know the mode by which it will transpire. But they've heard it. And they've seen testimonials of the truth of who Jesus is. This moment of the transfiguration is given to the disciples, Peter, James, and John, those closest to him, to build up their faith for a time of reckoning. My friends, Jesus knows if there is going to be an atomic bomb dropped during this upcoming century. Jesus knows when the next mass shooting will take place. Jesus knows when the next downfall of a public person will take place. He knows when the next crisis will happen for each one of us. He knows when your personal next Good Friday will come. Jesus knows when the next pandemic will happen. And Jesus is giving us graces in order to prepare us that in coming to a point of scandal, a tripping hazard, we might not fall and stay down. That we might overcome that moment of difficulty, that moment of even grave pain. That we might not just remain trapped on Good Friday, but in moving past and saying, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go, even if you have really weird and inconvenient plans. And those who follow him see the glory of Easter Sunday. Now, here's the even more beautiful thing. Of the 12 apostles, how many showed up on Good Friday? One. How many did Jesus kick off his team of apostles after the resurrection? Zero. There were other, two other disciples who were walking away from Jerusalem towards Emmaus. And Jesus started walking with them as they were leaving the project of Jesus. They had said, we had hoped he would be the one that we were expecting. And Jesus meets them there. So here's the beautiful thing. Even when Jesus is building up our faith for the next crisis that is to come, and even if we don't faithfully move past that stumbling block, Jesus will faithfully bring us through it. Jesus will meet us in our point of pain. Just yesterday, I had a convalidation that somebody who got civilly married without ever getting married in the, into the church. And he had come to confession 
at some point last year and had been away from the church for a long time. Some priest mouthed off with a microphone decades ago and it really hurt this man. And it was an Uber driver in whose car he was riding had said, why would you leave the community and the Eucharist? Sure, priests don't always live up to what they're supposed to be. But why would you leave the truth of who Jesus is in the Eucharist and the community that he never ceases to gather to himself? It was this moment where his Uber driver was it inviting him back to encounter the living God. And then this free fall of graces has been happening in his life. And his kids are starting to come back to church. And there's starting to be great healing. Even those who walk away from Jesus, Jesus goes after. That's the beauty of who our God is. That's the beauty of why we don't need to make ourselves good enough for God. He will respect our freedom, yes. But he will also go after us with a furious longing to be with us eternally. One last thought for you. In another preface that often gets used at Mass, although it won't today, it says, Jesus, fulfilling his will and gaining for God the Father a holy people, he stretched out his hands as he endured his passion, so as to break the bonds of death and manifest the resurrection. The transfiguration is this moment of the manifestation of the hidden divinity of God. So too, you and I have moments of transfiguration in our lives where God just breaks through and shows how he's got this, shows how he's good, he's loving, even if he permits other people to misuse their free will. For each of us who are baptized here, we have within us a hidden spark of divinity. And so the point of assuming is you and I have to assume the presence of God in each one of the people that are around you, even when they don't live up to it, even when they're total meanies. And assuming the presence of God, when the presence of God is made manifest in these very specific breakthrough moments that build up our faith for a time of Good Friday so that we might reach Easter Sunday, you and I learn to be faithful the day in and day out. And in so doing, we receive the freedom of the children of God. Praised be Jesus Christ, now and forever. Let us stand and profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. There's a harsh reality in the life of the church today, which is when priests get moved from one parish to another. And that can be its own scandal in the hearts of parishioners. It was really tough to leave the community that grew me in my priesthood from the first four years. And it was really hard for them to lose me, for me to lose them. So to every parish that undergoes some kind of change, especially in pastor, has to overcome a scandal, a difficulty of heart. Am I open to new ways? Am I open to the way in which the Lord is working through this priest and that priest? And some don't overcome that scandal. A good priest is always supposed to pull a John the Baptist. What is that? Point beyond him. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world through my priesthood, through his own workings. Here at this parish, we worship one man, Jesus Christ, the God-man. And so even long after I leave and the next priest comes and the next priest comes, we will be pointing to Jesus to say, follow him, remain with him, And every other priest is going to die. But Jesus lives forever and draws us to him. 
And so that's the beauty of following Jesus. He leads us beyond every scandal, every stumbling block, every difficulty of faith, and brings us into the kingdom of his divine light. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks Thanks be to God. God.